It's the GLB from Mercedes-Benz. Here's what we think of this new animal in the SUV arena from the star. The Škoda Karok, another car that could do very well in India. And the big update, once again, on the Renault Duster. We have that review. Hello everyone, this is CNB. Thank you for joining us. I'm Siddharth Panayak Patankar. We'll jump straight into what's turned out to be a bit of an SUV special. SUVs, the sports utility vehicle. You love him, I love him, the whole world seems to love him and you know what? It's no surprise why. It's uh, sort of a bit of a sweet spot, an intersection if you will, of many different consumer demands that the SUV seems to address. And that's why there are so many of them driving into our market as well. We start off with a first look at the Mercedes-Benz GLB that is likely to be heading your way pretty soon. It is the latest in an expanding range of SUVs from Mercedes-Benz. The new GLB aims to create a niche within the compact premium SUV space, which will see it straddle two segments bigger than the GLA and a tad smaller than the GLC. The car was unveiled alongside the global test drive of the big sister GLS in Utah, USA. The setting was quite apt for the GLB too, since it's not only another SUV, but it's also going to be made in Mercedes-Benz's Alabama plant in the US. SUVs account for the maximum selling Mercedes-Benz models worldwide now and uh, these are the latest figures that have just been shared with us. We've got the flagship SUVs back there, that's the G, the GLS, the new GLE which we're still waiting for in India, we've got the GLC which has recently been given its mid-cycle facelift and uh, of course the GLA which was the tiny baby of the family and it's between the GLA and C, if you know your alphabets of course, that you know the GLB fits in. Now, in terms of size, in terms of attribute, also it kind of has that nice compact footprint. Two big differences that really stand out. Of course, you get the new styling, the new design language, but it's kind of squarish and boxy, unlike the other cars, which are more coupe-like. And uh, the second thing, well, it is compact, but it's still a seven-seater, and uh, that kind of fits a hole in the market, a very lucrative one, according to Mercedes-Benz, because guess what the second highest selling segment for the company is worldwide? compact cars and so this one is an SUV and a compact car and which is why the company thinks it has big hopes from it. So let's get this right. The GLB is 4,634 millimeters long with a 2,829 millimeter wheelbase. It has a generous 1658 millimeter height while width comes in at 1834 millimeters. Now, compare that to both the GLA on the one hand and the GLC on the other and you can see where it fits and how it is actually taller than both those cars. And it's still also a potential rival then for something like the X3. The car is not in line with the baby G-Wagon feel that the 2012 Energy Force concept had exuded. At the time, there was a lot of speculation that this will be the GLB. Well, the face on the production car is a safer GL family derivative, though of course it has its own signature DRLs. But yes, the squarer profile and higher roof are more G-like. On the inside though, the car is its own model and very much more in line with its platform siblings, the A-Class sedan and the new B-Class. Aircraft inspired AC vents, very funky looking, use of very interesting materials, lots of metal, dark surfaces, there's carbon fibre here, 
and uh, you can of course customize that we're told but it's just the layout the design in terms of tech it's everything new that you expect from mercedes you've got the mbux the the big screens but in terms of layout in terms of design like i was saying is where the newness comes in you've got a good sense of space up here as well there's a sunroof and everything looks very quirky very innovative and modern and uh, it's likely to appeal therefore to a new kind of buyer dare i say a younger buyer Younger or older, buyers will like its ease of entry. The second row is not as roomy as it could have been because designers have had to leave room for either the third row in that seven-seat configuration or a generous boot, something many crossovers cannot boast. Certainly very different in its overall layout and design appeal on the inside, but it's the sense of space that is pretty impressive. Even though this is a small car, in terms of legroom, in terms of headroom, you do get a good sense and this knowing the fact that there could be a third row as well. That optional third row is tight. It's good on seat back angle and even under thigh support. But the floor is higher and tall adults will not want to be here for long distances. Build quality though appears to be good and the boot in the 5 seat configuration is really great. Engine options on the GLB are two petrols and two diesels. Well, three diesels. The first petrol is a 1.3 liter four cylinder unit that can shut down one cylinder for efficiency when not needed. The four wheel drive petrol is the GLB 250 4MATIC. This 2 liter unit gets the 8 speed DCT transmission and a 220 bhp output. The diesel side sees the 200D available in two different variants, the 2 and 4 wheel drive formats. The output on both models is the same at 147 bhp and both get the 8G DCT gearbox. And the powerful diesel is the 220D 4MATIC. It uses the same engine as the 200D but tuned to offer 186 bhp and 80 Nm more of peak torque. The Mercedes-Benz GLB will begin to roll into global markets in the second half of this year and will be followed by the second generation GLA class in 2020. Now keep in mind that the next GLA is likely to retain its sporty, compact and lower profile to keep a separation between it and the more practical and spacious GLB. How the GLB differs from the GLC is already apparent to you. So will India get the GLB? I am calling it a jalebi and so just for that reason alone I think it should come to us. But jokes apart, my firm belief is that we should get the GLA, GLB and GLC as between them Mercedes-Benz could really corner a sizable chunk of the premium SUV space especially at the compact end. The current GLA has been pretty popular here in India, don't forget. Mercedes-Benz India and its global headquarter will now initiate an internal discussion on whether India should get the GLA or GLB or indeed both cars. Your feedback will help shape some of that conversation, so do tell us what you think should happen. The GLB certainly looks promising for India. Now there was news coming in this week about how there's a certain strategy brewing at the Volkswagen brand that is going to be an SUV only company in a sense when it comes to its approach to the Indian market. Now remember, what VW does is linked to the larger India plan that's headed by Skoda and so which means that if VW is going to go SUV heavy, well obviously Skoda will too because uh, the manufacturing strategy between those two brands is linked. And so the Karok from Skoda which is the younger sibling of the Kodiak becomes important. Is it confirmed right now for India? No, but it certainly seems to be headed that way and we got our first impressions on the car when Seishan spent some time with it back at Skoda's home. Skoda's first SUV was the practical and clever little Yeti. That was 10 years ago and in 2018 the Karok drove in as its successor. While India did get the Yeti as a pricey yet well-built car in 
we are yet to see the karok but we are told that will change by next year although it was introduced almost 2 years ago it is still important for us because skoda is planning to launch the suv in india by late 2020 Today we got to spend some limited time with the SUV in Prague and here's what we have to say about the upcoming Skoda Karok. This is the top spec Karok sport line trim and it essentially looks like a downscaled version of the bigger and glitzier Kodiak. Up front the Karok gets a similar face with the signature butterfly grille rectangular headlamps with Skoda's crystalline design elements LED daytime running lamps and trapezoidal fog lamps positioned below However the visual highlight of the Sportline trim is the extensive use of glossy black elements which can be seen on the grill bumper and ORVMs The black treatment works particularly well with the deep red paint scheme There's a similar black treatment added to the roof rails, side skirts and a set of handsome looking 18 inch Mitikas light alloy wheels. And then there's the Sportline badging above the front fender. Rear has a nicely sculpted tailgate with stylish C-shaped wrap around LED tail lamps and body colored bumpers. The contrast here is added by the black underbody cladding. with an end to end chrome insert adding a premium touch there's a premium black interior and the cabin comes across as well finished straight away but the suv also comes with the stylish sporty uh, bucket style seats that are upholstered in black fabric along with contrast cross stitching the rear comes with a bench seat with 60 40 split along with a foldable armrest and other creature comforts like a panoramic sunroof and rear ac vents The Karok we drove featured the top of the line 9.2 inch Columbus infotainment touchscreen equipped with Apple CarPlay Android Auto navigation and more The Sportline trim also gets a sporty flat bottom steering wheel with contrast white stitching and a fully digital instrument cluster. Yes, Skoda also offers the virtual cockpit system as an option. The car with us had a 1.5 liter TSI petrol engine and yes, it's most likely to be introduced in the Indian model as well. The four-cylinder turbo petrol engine offers 148 brake horsepower, but the engine likes to be revved hard, and maximum power comes around 6,000 RPM. The motor also offers ample torque, 250 newton meters to be precise, and all of it is available from as low as 1,500 RPM, thus offering a strong low and mid range. While Skoda offers an optional 7-speed DSG automatic gearbox, we drove the 6-speed manual. The suspension too does a great job of handling some of the minor undulations that came our way, offering a comfortable ride. Initially, it does feel a bit stiff, but it starts to feel just right as you drive the car a bit. The car also handles well and is in line with expectations you would have from a VW Group product in any case. Its compact proportions lend to that handling and ride quality is also good. The Skoda Karok certainly makes a strong case for itself. It's good looking, well equipped and well built. It also offers great ride and handling. However, it will have a tough time going up against upcoming competition like the MG Hector and Kia Seltos along with existing players like the Tata Harrier and the Jeep Compass. So it all boils down to the pricing of the SUV. And if Skoda gets that right, staying well under 17 or even 16 lakh rupees It will certainly be a strong contender 
in the compact SUV space. Well, we also brought you exclusive information, not on an SUV. This is the Grand i10 from Hyundai, the next generation car. Will come to us on the 20th of August, and that's a whole month before it makes its global debut at the Frankfurt Motor Show. So, again, India gets a priority when it comes to a new product on the compact side from Hyundai. With that, we take a short break. We come back with more details on the new Renault Duster in our review. Welcome back. Another exclusive story that we broke on carandbike.com was about how Renault has a strategy to use India as the lead market for the third generation of the Duster. So globally, I'm talking, India will be the one to lead it. But that also means that the second generation that's gone on sale about two years ago globally is not coming to India. That's now confirmed. And so Renault India has no choice but to sort of stretch out the current car. So it's a bit unprecedented, doesn't really happen anymore as it used to in the past. But yes, we are getting a second facelift on the Duster. And that's the kind of thing you've seen happening on, let's say, the XUV 500, isn't it? So two facelifts down, how relevant is the car now? Does it still retain some of its strong qualities? And what's new? And also remember that there will be another tweaking, another change that will come when, of course, the whole market moves to BS6. But that notwithstanding, for now, with its existing engines, these are the changes on the new Duster. We were the first ones to tell you that India won't get the second generation Renault Duster, but will be the lead market for the third gen car. And so, the current Duster gets its second big facelift to keep the sales going till the third generation Duster comes in by 2021. But is this facelift enough? Especially given new arrivals like the Tata Harrier, MG Hector and the soon to be launched Kia Seltos have moved the benchmark in the compact SUV space much higher. The Duster kick-started the compact SUV segment in India when it was launched in 2012. Since then, the Duster has got two major facelifts and a small one. But the model generation stayed the same. For 2019, the Duster gets yet another facelift. But it will be 2021 before India gets the new generation Duster. Will it be enough to sustain the sales till then? Let's see what all has changed. The hood gets a few creases, which gives the front end some muscle. It's been raised too in order to meet the new pedestrian safety guidelines as well. The top spec RXZ also gets newly designed Everest diamond cut alloy wheels, which up the premium quotient of the SUV. The rear stays the same, more or less. Renault says that the Duster facelift 2019 gets over 25 new updates. But the biggest one has to be to the face. The headlamp cluster has been completely redesigned and now it gets projector lamps along with newly designed LED daytime running lights. The front grille is also completely new. It's a tri-wing design and it's full of chrome. Definitely has a fresh, energizing appeal. The new Duster also has two new color options, which are mahogany brown and Caspian Blue, which is the colour of the car that we have with us. The interior gets subtle updates too. The dashboard gets new rectangular AC vents instead of the earlier circular ones. The body coloured inserts on the dashboard add to the glam factor along with the new upholstery on the seats with blue contrast stitching. And the steering unit is new too but gets the same buttons as before for audio and the cruise control. The interior too has been updated with new upholstery and a new 7-inch touchscreen infotainment system. It gets Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Along with that, it also gets an Eco Guide. So what this Eco Guide does is, it monitors your driving patterns and tells you how to improve efficiency. The dust also misses out on small features such as this, the armrest for the co-driver. Otherwise, the cabin, it retains its roominess and comfort. The Duster facelift continues to get the same 1.5-litre petrol and diesel engines, 
with the diesel in two states of tune. The petrol engine makes 104.5 brake horsepower and peak torque of 142 newton meters. The 1.5 litre diesel makes 84 brake horsepower and 200 newton meters of torque, and its more powerful variant makes 108.5 brake horsepower and has a peak torque of 245 newton meters. The duster continues to shine as far as driving joy is concerned. Its suspension is still one of the most balanced in the segment and the SUV retains its handling prowess. We drove the diesel variant with a higher output. The engine has oodles of torque to play around with once it reaches about 1800 rpm. And yes, the first gear is still too short for our liking, but otherwise the gearbox feels precise. It is still the only SUV in its segment to get optional all-wheel drive, which means it can take on the rough too. Like before, Renault also offers a CVT gearbox for the petrol engine variant and a six-step AMT gearbox for the diesel engine model. The competition already has stock converters and dual clutch automatic cars in its lineup though. Pricing is a huge advantage for the Duster 2. It is one of the most affordable SUVs in its segment with prices starting from 8 lakh rupees and going up to 12 and half lakh rupees. Like we said earlier, the new SUV launches in the segment have upped the ante many times over and the Duster is still in its first generation model. But the Duster has that butch appeal which wins your heart over. Yes, it scores low on features and the design might seem a little too long in the tooth but it is still too early to count it out. So we were a bit SUV obsessed on this episode, please react to it and any other SUVs you'd like to see, well we've got a few more lined up for you so even next week you will have some from us but yeah sure send in your wish list, any queries you have on the market, remember speaking of SUVs the Kia Seltos is also on its way so there's lots to look forward to besides all the other new cars we've just spoken about. Please react to it, please do wear your helmets if you're on a bike, we haven't forgotten that and of course wear your seatbelts in a car front or back. With that, I want to say goodbye. See you next week.